Hello, everybody. I'm uh, Dr. Dimitrios Kostopoulos, and I am uh, the co-founder of Hands-On Seminars. Uh, and I would like to welcome each and every one of you tonight in uh, uh, this uh, presentation um, uh, hosting Dr. Antonio Steco, uh, who is clinical instructor at the RAS Rehabilitation NYU School of Medicine uh, and at the Sports Medicine Program at the uh, University of Padova in Italy, at the PhD program there and very, very well uh, known around the world with his published research and his courses and programs um, uh, in, around the area of fascial manipulation. Um, and um, as uh, many of you know, hands-on seminars has been uh, uh, one of the key uh, sponsors of the uh, STECO concept of fascial manipulation in the United States. And uh, uh, tonight, uh, we would like to, we have the opportunity to have uh, Dr. Stecco himself uh, here at the headquarters of Hands-On Seminars and we will be discussing with him uh, both some of the um, introductory and basic uh, elements of the uh, fascial um, manipulation approach uh, and at the same time you uh, will have the opportunity to ask any specific questions that you may have, especially if you are more familiar with uh, the uh, step of fascial manipulation um, uh, concept. Um, so during the uh, duration of the uh, presentation, uh, you will have the opportunity to actually ask questions by typing those questions in the chat portion of the um, program that you have of the uh, go to webinar program uh, those of you who have a pc you should be able to view a panel on the right hand side of your computer uh, and those of you who have a mac computer or you're watching this through an ipad you should have a button that would be able to make the function of uh, 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 having a, a chat box appearing where you can type a question. Uh, alternatively, if you want to actually ask the question and be heard, uh, you will be able to um, uh, raise a hand by clicking a button that you have a question and then we can open your microphone which is right now muted so we can um, uh, uh, unmute you so you can be able to um, uh, ask your question. Um, but before um, I introduce uh, Dr. Steco officially, I would like to ask each and every one of you a quick question and give you the opportunity to answer this question uh, right there in uh, your screens. So um, the question right now uh, is a poll question, which is, where have you heard about the STECO fascial manipulation concept? Um, and you have uh, various options, and you can uh, um, click as many of these options as you like in terms of resources where you have uh, gotten information about the uh, STECO fascial manipulation uh, concept. Uh, this is valuable information for us um, uh, as uh, we um, increase our presence uh, with the uh, STECO courses here in the United States. And I do thank you uh, very much, those of you who answered um, uh, the poll. Thank you. Uh, and uh, um, those of you who uh, want to see the actual data, um, you can see right now the outcomes of the poll. All right, and uh, uh, one more question is, um, just please let us know whether have you taken an actual, an official course of the STECO Fascial Manipulation um, uh, Program in the past? Um, if you have taken, um, any of the series of the courses, we're not talking about you just reading uh, his book, we're talking about actually 
um, doing an official course? Uh, you have to answer yes, otherwise you answer no. All right, very good. And uh, it seems that the vast majority of the people, about 82% of you, uh, have not taken uh, any official course of the fascial manipulation concept of Dr. Steckel. And that is great because that um, uh, kind of uh, helps Dr. Steckel uh, gear the conversation tonight uh, for the appropriate public. So, Dr. Steckel, welcome. Well, thanks a lot. Thanks for the invitation, Dimitris. It's always a pleasure to be here. And thanks to hands-on seminar to make it happen. So it's a pleasure for me to be here. Thank you. So the, the very first question that uh, I, I have to, to ask, and I'm sure that people who have not been exposed to your concept, um, they, the, word, the word myofascia, myofascia, and myofascia is a word that has been associated with a variety of uh, concepts out there and treatment techniques. So if you can give us a little bit of a historical perspective on of how the stack of fascial manipulation concept was developed and what sets the steco technique apart from other fascial techniques? Well, I have to tell you, next year will be like the anniversary, it will be 30 year of fashion manipulation. So my father is the inventor, he wrote the first textbook in 1987. So already at that time, he explained that fascia is a key element for musculoskeletal system. Fascia was well connected with the muscle. We know at this time that 30% of muscle fiber merge in the fascia, not in the tendon. So he tried to evaluate through this section to study why we have such amount of muscle fiber that do not work doesn't, for uh, movement straight away, but they generate tension in the fascia. Then he started to understand so the, the continuity between muscle and fascia, how the two work together, how monoarticular, biarticular muscle through the fascia are able to coordinate the movement how synergic muscle in different segments can coordinate the mechanics of the movement through the fascia that is like a bridge. And finally, we were able to understand the narration of fascia. Fascia is well narrated. We have a lot of uh, mechanoreceptor, but also nociceptor that was proved by different researchers in Europe and in America as well. So for a lot of people, fascia is a key element Fascia is a pain generator that we have so, to so, so, so when we say, when we talk about, let's say, muscle pain, right, um, what we call as muscle pain, then it is not necessarily generated by muscle, but it is potentially generated by nociceptors on the fascial tissue? Well, we have a, a great variability of the situation, but the, what literature support is, first of all, we have a clear literature that explains it. The tendon ligament have a very, very poor innervation. And the, the small innervation they have, are mostly are gorgical muscle, so they are not dedicated to pain at all. Plus, also muscle, muscle is innervated. We have, but this is a free and nerve nociceptor, a lot of the time are located in the connective tissue that have a, a fixed dimension. So they can perceive better when there is an overstretch. Muscle, the muscle fiber by itself, have a, a great variability in the dimension. So it's not the best tissue to perceive when there is an overstretch, when there is like a, a like say, let's say a tear or, or we go over the maximal dimension of the length of the muscle fiber. So the fascia is an excellent structure tissue because have a slight uh, elasticity, but at the same time, a sort of fixed dimension that allow uh, to stimulate the mechanical set in a proper way, if everything goes smoothly. So, so now, uh, I'm gonna give a hypothetical architectural design question of the human body, right? Um, if a muscle, a muscle bundle, a muscle fiber, did not have any fascia surrounding it, how would it be different? So in other words, 
A different way to ask the same question is how fascia contributes to the function of the muscle itself. We have like two major uh, rule of fascia. So one is poor mechanics, one is proprioception in relation as well to the muscle spindle. So mechanics is very simple. So fascia is able to spread the tension of the muscle far away and uh, in the synergic muscle as more by articular muscle and also in the muscle that are above and below. So through the fascia we are able to spread the tension and to coordinate better the activation of different muscle. Otherwise it will be like a robot, we will move like a robot. Second, we don't have to forget, uh, forget that it's true, muscle spindle are inside the muscle. But it's proven that the muscle spindle, the caps of the muscle spindle are in the perimysium, that is in direct connection with the epimysium. So this connective tissue inside the muscle is a key element for the pre-activation. Without uh, a stretching of the perimysium, there will be not the loop that through gamma and alpha motor and will not take place. So we will not have the pre-activation and we will not have able to have like the modulation of the activation of the muscle in relation of, of the necessity. Because we know that the muscle doesn't contract all in once. But there is a, a different uh, time. So this uh, modulation is permitted by the tension of the fascia that will adjust the activation of the muscle spindle. And so the amount of, of motor unit that will be activated. Finally, fascia is full of mechanoreceptor. So the mechanoreceptor will help to increase what we call proprioception. That now is extremely common concept. Everybody speaks about fascia proprioception. But in 1987, my father was one of the first to introduce the concept that fascia is the key end for proprioception and so forth, coordinate the movement in the space. Hmm. So now, so fascia plays all these roles, right? Now, how fascia will get injured? What is the mechanism that will end up injuring fascia? We have like two uh, categories, let's say. We have what we call fibrosis. And we have introduced a new terminology, densification. So about fibrosis, I think it's simple. So it's fibrotic tissue. So increase of collagen fiber type 1, type 3. So this is uh, due to surgery, severe trauma with lesion, uh, uh, edema. So important uh, event that will affect the quality of the credit tissue. In this case, MRI, CT scan, ultrasound will uh, visualize this alteration. So normally it's uh, extremely easy to make diagnosis. It's not the common event. It, for sure, it takes uh, a little more time to resolve the problem. At the opposite, we have something else that we call densification. This is a big news for clinician, not for bioengineer. Right. Because the bioengineer is more than 15 years that they know about this. Yeah. So there was a lack of uh, communication between bioengineer and, uh, and clinician. So what they found, they found that uh, the typical substance that we can call extracellular matrix or loose connective tissue it should have a normal viscosity. But the bioengineer found that in a very specific condition, like when this lubricant in a spread surface, think about the interface between uh, epimysium, deep fascia, between a different layer of deep fascia. Well, in this condition, if the amount of this substance increase, it can aggregate, it can dramatically increase the viscosity. So there are many factors that can generate this increase of viscosity, like overuse, because a specific cell that we have studied in laboratory, we have called fascia sites, will produce more amount of this substance that is a, a, a particular type of hyaluronic acid. In this one, if we don't move it, we don't stretch, it can aggregate. And so overuse can lead to muscle stiffness, plus alteration of the temperature, like let's say the Typical patients say, look, when the weather changes, my neck hurts. That's right. Okay. And if they put ice, forget it. I have to have a hot shower to feel better. So this is, cannot be an inflammation because inflammation with hot package, it should increase the vasodilatation to so make worse. 
But the patient tells you that I feel better. That's right. Okay. So all these patients, is a huge amount of patients, they have myofascial pain syndrome. If people thought that there is an inflammation, did you don't have to touch this patient because you not, you know, not get better? In reality, these are the typical patients that have a great result treating with a fascia regulation or with a fascia. Exactly. What, what you say, like in the entire training that uh, uh, physical therapists, physicians uh, are receiving um, in terms uh, of uh, uh, the behavior of muscle and treatment of muscle, uh, it, it felt kind of counterintuitive always. How come that you have an inflammatory process and instead of, with a stiff neck, let's say, and instead of responding well, let's say, to ice and not to heat, it prefers heat, you know, in a case like that, despite the fact that supposedly we have that type of inflammation in the muscle component itself. But I think that this is a, a great point since you start discussing also uh, in your uh, comment now about the extracellular matrix to perhaps give us a, a few of the points that you have uh, prepared for tonight uh, for this uh, uh, presentation. So um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put this right here into presenter mode like this. Uh, so you'll be able to just start presenting a few things. So basically, this is a quite important article that tells you that if you put a needle, you make an injection in the erectospine in the fascia, in the subcutis, uh, the patient will complain more pain when uh, we inject uh, the fascia. So this means that uh, in the low back area, fascia is the major pain generator. So we cannot forget about this tissue. It is the tissue that can generate more pain in the patient. Is the tissue that we should address in our treatment. So as I said, uh, we have like different kind of problem in the fascia. We have an alteration of the loose connective tissue, an alteration of the fibrotic tissue, okay, collagen, fiber type 1, type 3. So we will not spend so much time about type 1, type 3 is well known, but about densification, so increase of the loose connective tissue, this is new. I think it will be new for a lot of people. So here we have a nice imaging that show up a 3D reconstruction of the uh, deep fascia or thoracolumbar fascia. You can see the three layer as it, it normally is composed plus the loose connective tissue in the middle. So fibrosis, everybody know, after injury, you will have fibrosis. Densification is something very particular. is an increase of the viscosity of the loose connective tissue. So basically, we can see right here an MRI where you see a scar above the thoracolumbar fascia. On the right, we have a densification. We have, for example, the, the publication of uh, Langerine that showed that people with chronic lumbar pain have a decrease of degliding between a different layer of the thoracolumbar fascia. So this is a clear element that will tell you, look, the MRI is not positive. So the patient have not a clear anatomic alteration, but with a very specific evaluation that is not the common one, you can appreciate that the sliding of the fascia is incorrect. So this stiffness, this pain, is nothing as at a like nociceptor pain. It's an overstimulation of the mechanoreceptor, nociceptor, that is a, that are in an incorrect environment, in a stiff environment. So if the mechanoreceptor are in a stiff environment, the threshold of uh, the activation of this nociceptor will be lower. That's right. So you have an overactivation of this nociceptor without uh, a lesion, a clear lesion. So these are the typical patients that uh, they have uh, like a diagnosis that go from a non-specific musculoskeletal pain, uh, mechanical over pain. Nobody is able to figure out what's wrong because MRI is not the, t the correct uh, evaluation, like CT scan, like dynamic ultrasound, <coughs> it can give you some uh, information about this. So the sliding is extremely important. Sliding allows you range of motion. Sliding allows you to activate correctly the mechanoreceptor and nociceptor. So to have a, the correct proprioception, and this could be fundamental for athletes. We have proof with different articles. We are able to restore and to improve the balance of the athletes. Okay? As well, the publication that is now uh, accepted, we have proved that we can 
save injury during the season without a pre-season evaluation treatment. So this is a nice image of the fascia. You see the collagen fiber one over the other. What we have described as first in the 1987 that the fascia is a multiple layer structure. So for century and century, people thought it is a mesh. In reality, it's a multiple layer structure that uh, allows a gliding between one layer and the other. When this gliding disappears or decreases, uh, patients start to complain stiffness. Okay. So this is a very critical element because uh, under the light that the fascia is a multiple layer structure, we have to understand that the gliding and the low transmission that the fascia can generate is extremely important. So, like in, in China right now, they are extremely excited with our work and we are keep going 10 times a year. Why? Because the fascia can be the anatomical explanation of the meridian. Fascia is able to transmit the load in different directions in relation of the direction of the collagen fiber. In the collagen fiber, they have a specific direction due to the load that they have to carry. So we have studied, we have tried to map the direction of the collagen fiber to understand better the biomechanics between synergic muscle and the correlation that there is between different uh, compartments inside the body. Uh, uh, let me ask you, what is the mechanism that uh, you and your father and, and, and sister uh, you used to actually identify the direction of tension of fascia. All right, so we start from a, a simple evaluation through palpation, okay? Because it's the simple one, uh, it, it is more the clinical one. We have published an article, at, uh, or two articles, uh, plus one about uh, the paratheno of the tendon, where we show that elastosonography can uh, uh, evaluate the stiffening of the fascia. Right. And we prove that, for example, in one specific point, the fascia was stiff, we treated the fascia would become more elastic. Or we study, for example, another area in the neck, and we show that the fascia was altered, and after the treatment, the fascia became thinner, okay? It was in the follow-up of three, six months, it was better than the control group. So our few study, I don't want to say that there are enough to prove everything. But what is very curious that the three biggest group around the world that are studying FASH with the ultrasound for different reasons, also for trigger point, they have find out the same. Because if we take a look at Siddharth and, uh, and uh, Jay Shah study about trigger point, they find out the trigger point inside a muscle is a hypoechogenic right. area with the increase of the stiffness. So how is possible that an area that is more fluid, in reality is more stiff than the surrounding area, that have more collagen fiber. So they are not able to explain. But that is nothing else that uh, an increase of the viscosity of the loose quantity tissue. So it's more extracellular matrix, but have a high viscosity. So what they found is what I have found, and what Elena Langer has found as well. So this leads more to this densification of the tissue concept. Correct, way. correct, correct. And by the way, the bioengineer have proven in laboratory that this can happen. And in the human body, the reaction is more dramatic because the reaction, so the ironic acid attach with the Van der Waals hydrophobic force, then become a spiral, attach other protein, push out the water. So you have a macromolecular crowding, so a huge molecular hydrophobic that obviously will make all the, the substance more viscous. So it's a is a critical uh, uh, article that I suggest maybe to have a look in PubMed that will explain for the clinician this particular reaction that was well understood by the engineer but not from the clinician. Hmm. Very good. Well, let's uh, continue. Very interesting. So this is like a, an example that show you how the direction of the collagen fiber are not random. So literature will tell you that it's random, but in reality it's a multiple layer. So it depends on from the perspective. If you see from the, uh, the frontal part, it looks like a, a irregular mesh. But then you separate the one from the other, and you see that the anatomy is, is unbelievable. Anything, everything has a particular explanation. The problem is that we don't know. A lot of times we are not able. Okay. So this is fundamental because think about uh, stress compartment syndrome. 
what happened? There is no adaptation of what? Of the fashion. Why there is no adaptation of fashion? Because this gliding is, uh, is luck. Okay? So there is no possibility for the calf to increase the diameter because there is no gliding between different layers. So these are another population of people that are, are having good results with this approach because everybody knows that the fascia is the key element of this disorder. So if we try to stress a piece of fascia, you see that time after time you are able to see the collagen fiber. It takes a while to, to break. The fascia lata, nobody is able to break longitudinal, for example, because it's too Very strong. strong. But you can realize the collagen fiber. You can see with your eyes the collagen fiber when you do a dissection. So these collagen fiber are for sure the key element for transmit the load. Okay? But we don't have to forget that the loose connective tissue allow the, each layer to glide in the correct direction. So you cannot transmit the load if the three layer fascia are not able to glide. The typical example is uh, around the greater trochanter, for example. Over there, we have three layer fascia. One oblique that, have a, that is the insertional tendon of the gluteus maximus. One vertical that is the continuity of the tensor fascia lata. Another one transversal that uh, has different contributions from the gluteus medium, vastus lateralis. So you can imagine that the gliding right there has to uh, occur. Otherwise, the patient cannot make an abduction extra rotation. So a lot of time, what happened? The patient have uh, like a rigidity in the ankle, in the hip, and then the X-ray show up a very moderate arthritis, arthrosis, or maybe just a libron tear. My libron tear is what? Is a consequence of the stiffness of the biomechanics. Mm -hmm. So treated libron tear will not fix the problem because the libron tear is a consequence of the biomechanics in coordination. Unfortunately, MRI, what we will show? The libron the tear. tear. Will not yeah. show the alteration of the fascia, okay? So this is the big problem that we had for century and century because, because the elastosonography or specific type of MRI is not a, clean, a typical evaluation. But lucky for us, the hand helps a lot. Hand will help us to understand where these areas are activated. So these are the fascia sites, the, the cell that we have studied in laboratory. This is the cell that produces hyaluronic acid in the fascia. But we are studying to evaluate if immobility changes the, their function or overstress will uh, stimulate a production of hyaluronic acid, but the incorrect one, the one that can aggregate and can generate stiffness. So there are a lot of different uh, disorders that can generate a uh, uh, problem in the fashion. So for sure, inflammation will affect the fashion. Uh, we know that uh, after inflammation, we have a remodeling of, of the connective tissue, okay? But uh, if, uh, if we want to see a little bit better some uh, information about uh, the densification, we can eventually go ahead with, uh, uh, with the imaging that show exactly how this process happened and how we can uh, resolve the disorder. Yeah. So, Let's move on uh, and let's try to explain what are the different uh, problems that you can have. So aging makes the fashion more stiff, okay? Um, so, so uh, okay, aging, right? Mm -hmm. Why aging will make the fashion more stiff? Is it uh, uh, the lack of movement uh, that will do it? The person becomes less active? or there is a, an actual physiological factor that will lead to that? All right, this is an excellent question. Uh, so we saw that immobilization make the fascia more stiff. This is, uh, is proven. But the aging make the fascia more stiff, uh, maybe for two, two factors. All right. One is due to the, the alteration of the quality of the tissue. But the second one, uh, maybe is the most important because not everybody are in, are in a bad situation, uh, 70, even 80. So, for example, densification do not go away by itself. So, 
year after year you start to compensate. So your body will generate new disinfectants to try to readjust the biomechanics of the body. So from a clinical experience, we saw that uh, a trauma also 10, 20 years ago, even 40, it can keep an alteration of the fascia for such a long time that that uh, trauma, for example, a fracture of the malleolus, it will generate a tension that can uh, help or help. It can be a cofactor for the development of a sciatic pain because overuse, because the guy is doing a lot of uh, carry activity. And so stiffness uh, around the hip, plus stiffness uh, distally for a previous injury, this subject will be easier to, to start to feel the typical pain uh, around, uh, uh, along all the leg. How about if the person throughout their lifetime, they have multiple surgeries and um, they don't have to be surgeries because of a specific joint problem. They can be, let's say, somebody receives a, a cardiothoracic surgery. Somebody receives a, an abdominal surgery. Um, how would these surgical procedures, which of course they cut through the fascia yeah. and they suture muscle, would these affect in any capacity the fascial mobility? Uh, perhaps even scar formation? Yeah, a very curious question. So, um, depending on the location of the scar, and depend also what happened after the, the, the surgery, it, what, how will be the suture. So, basically, the location of the scar is, is critical. We have mapped the body. There are critical areas of the body where the gliding of the fascia is more important because the fascia doesn't glide in all the place. In some places, there is a fusion between the layers. So, for instance, if there is a scar over there, patient have a full quality of life. If the scar is in the critical area where there is a gliding, that will generate symptoms, but not the right away, not in that layer. It can be in the opposite area. It can be in two segments above. So, for instance, a laparotomy, a xiphopubic uh, surgery, is it doesn't generate so much symptom like a bad uh, inguinal uh, herniation. Okay because the mesh they put over the inguinal region is a critical area where there is the fascia lata that emerges in the abdominal region. The, iliac, the fascia of the iliacus is very close. A lot of time, just the needle goes too deep, fuse the fascia lata with the fascia of the iliacus. The patient will be, have pain all over the leg and sciatic pain. Not right after, maybe in a few months, a few years, but it will happen. So this is like a, the location is critical. And we have relatively well mapped the area that the, it should be preserved by surgery. Not always is possible, but it, it would be better. So we are giving a lecture how to assess, how to proceed with the, the section to try to preserve this life. Second, for sure, is like a, the suture. Obviously, as many suture you do, are more you conserve the anatomy. But lucky for us, the fascia have a great ability to uh, recover. So we have a, we have a, evaluated with our orthopedic surgeon. Uh, how, for example, the scar of a uh, hip prothesis uh, recovered during the year. And we saw that uh, at the second uh, replacement, you can see the scar in the skin, you can see the scar in the glucose medium, but you cannot see the scar in the fascia lata. That's because right. fascia lata is able to recover Recovered. Okay, very well. So it's able to restore the biomechanics and so the function of, of the hip. So lucky for us, this, the, this teacher have a great ability but for some reason is not able to self record when there's a dislocation. When it's stiff that area is not able. We have to help. I see. Okay. Thank you. I'm sure uh, uh, some of the viewers share the uh, same question with me. I'll get your chair a little bit faster there. Okay. All right. Uh, yeah. So this is a nice uh, article that we have published. Is a uh, what we call a functional ankle instability. So it's a very important disorder. It will affect a lot of subjects, but in particular athletes. We have athletes that have stopped the career for this disorder. And what we have so? We have uh, evaluated with the MRI the retinacle of the ankle. In the retinacle of the ankle, we have understood that uh, they have a, 
a multiple function. It's not just to keep the ten in that place because it's not that they are not a real ligand. We found that they are full of mechanoceptor. Is the area that have a high concentration of mechanoceptor. So we say, look, why? What can happen to this structure? Because they, if they are so innervated, it could be extremely important for perception. So we have a make an MRI in all these subjects versus control. What we found? We found that at the first evaluation, the radiologists they find out in over 25 patients, just seven have a, like a edema or a previous alteration of the ligament, peroneal stragalicus, peroneal All the other was negative. Then we studied together with another radiologist that have a background about fascia. We find out, like uh, you can see from this imaging, that there were 14 of these 25 subjects that have a clear alteration of the retinacula. But because the radiologists, they, they don't pay attention about this structure, for them the, the MRI was completely negative. In reality, this could be a clear way to objectify the alteration of fascia. And by the way, this patient was, were then treated with fascia population, and the stabilometric platform show an improvement at one month, three, and six months. So a specific treatment uh, over the fascia, over the retinacle, is a reinforcement of the fascia. It can generate uh, an improvement in pain right away, a range of motion right away, plus an improvement of the balance that will occur in one month because it takes a while to uh, reset the proprioception. But then this uh, proprioception will be even better three months in six months. Uh, I'm going to just interrupt for a moment because one of uh, our attendees here, Scott, uh, he is asking the question whether the treatment, the fashion manipulation treatment, also aims to restore proprioception if it, it affects proprioceptors. So we have uh, like uh, two articles uh, specific for proprioception. And we saw that the, the patient, with a, in respect to the control group, they have a, be a better proprioception. It doesn't happen right the day after, okay? There is already a better perception, but the, the, the best will happen like after two weeks because the patient has to be able to start one more time to train, right? Okay? So this patient, for example, was like two years and seven months that they were not able to train anymore for the symptom. So right away they feel better without pain, range of motion increase, they feel a little bit better for perception, they feel more stable, but then obviously for have a great result, you have to allow the patient to start one more time to train. And so we saw that uh, was curious for us, that uh, allow the people to restart the training is the best way to help them to recover the perception. So you have to make better the, the, the pain, you have to make better range of motion. You have to allow the retinacle to perceive as much as possible all the structure. It is will help right after the patient to improve perception. Very good. All right. So here you can see like how the gliding will occur, not just in the deep fascia, but also in the intermuscular septa. Intermuscular septa is a structure like the deep fascia. So also there you need a lot of gliding. And this gliding is permitted by the multiple layer of the uh, deep fascia. Obviously, the loose connective tissue that you can see is a key element. If this loose connective tissue becomes stiff, obviously the glide will not occur, so the patient will complain stiffness and obviously irritation of the mechanoceptor. So this is like a, an ultrasound that can show you the three layer of the deep fascia. One, two, and three, okay, at the level uh, of the tide, okay. Uh, video is not working as well, but you can, uh, and, um, because there are links, but uh, this was an example how, for example, a, a patient with a, a sciatic pain, in one side, isometric contraction will generate a, a nice sliding between the three layers, in the other side, it will not generate. So, about the certification, I think it's the most critical, most new information. So there are little to tell you, look, if you have an accumulation of hyaluronic acid, this will generate an increase of the viscosity. Okay. So elastosonography is a good way to evaluate. Okay. And as I showed before, this is a 
uh, a correlation between what we have uh, at this time in, in literature. So from uh, Harvard, like Elena Langevin, from uh, NIH or from our group, everybody is find out that the fascia become hypercogenic, more stiff and more thick and thicker. Right. So these are the three elements that uh, all the researchers are finding. So it's good that uh, from different perspectives everybody is reaching the same point. So decrease of the temperature increase the viscosity of the viscous tissue. So we can understand why when the weather change patients start to feel more stiff uh, and why at that time we can uh, perceive more pain because obviously stiffness is related. But also low pH will increase the, uh, the viscosity. I would like, I would be curious to ask also to, to, to you, if you have ever done like a half marathon or, or, or important activity, because at the end there would be normally, the patient will complain like when they stop to run like a sort of stiffness, okay? And then after 15 minutes, the go away. Why? Because intense exercise can decrease the pH in the muscle and the blood up to 6.6. If we can see from this graphic, the pH from 7.4 to 6.6, the viscosity of the hyaluronic acid increase of the 20-25%. A 20-25% of more stiffness is the same sensation that have an athlete at the end of a marathon. Because, because you produce lactic acid, lactic acid decreases the pH, and so increase the stiffness. But then in 20 minutes, 15 minutes, you restore the pH, you metabolize lactic acid, and the stiffness go away. We hypothesize that in some cases, in some area of the body, this circle, it will stop. So after an overuse or after an activity, you have a new area that are stiff. You can call trigger point, or we call like center coordination, but it's the same, an area that is stiff. And then uh, next time, if that air is stiff, uh, you will overuse the proximal and distal part. So it will be easier that you will generate an, another ridge of stiffness. At the time, uh, the antagonists have to work at 24 hours to try to keep you straight. So there will be an overuse of the antagonist. And so in this case, uh, you will start to have like, a, for example, stiffness. Then if you drive a couple hours, you will start to feel pain, uh, you're pulling the hamstring. Uh, Okay. Time after time, this uh, disorder will lead to pain and musculoskeletal problem. It, why not? Also, over stress over the minutes because there will be much more tension, much more, much more impact of the condylus. Uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, I'm sure that uh, many of the people who watch the presentation also, they, they are trigger point therapists or, or they have uh, um, a, a good exposure in myofascial trigger points. Um, a, a trigger point, especially if uh, it was created through uh, either a micro or a macro trauma with um, uh, some distraction of uh, uh, muscle fibers, uh, because of the uh, release of the uh, products of the cellular metabolism in the area, we do observe, and there are studies that do show that we do have a decrease, an increase of hydrogen ions, so we have an, a, 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 a low pH. Um, so that, ultimately, based on what you say now, we will decrease the fascial gliding, causing more stiffness in the area. So thinking now in terms of a treatment approach. Um, the question that somebody might pose is, would someone then treat the myofascial trigger point to get rid of that entity that is an entity within the muscle that, that, that causes this phenomena, such as the uh, decreased pH and anything else, nociception, um, or somebody will work first in the fascia, releasing the, um, uh, the surroundings of that myofascial to your point. You see? It's like a, a chicken or the egg type of uh, question, basically. Yeah, so we have an hypothesis because we, we don't have study in vivo that can confirm. But um, our hypothesis, like the type bandol, is not a spasm because it doesn't 
you cannot generate like a, a over contraction. So if you pull that area, it doesn't generate a spasm like a, a stretch reflex. Right. But you feel this tight bundle. Right. So our hypothesis is this: that uh, in the trunk, in particular, because in the limbs the anatomy is different. So in the limbs the fascia is more separate. In the in the trunk the fascia is completely adherent to the muscle. If the the, the deep fascia is completely adherent, becomes stiff. A two layer of perimage becomes stiff. You have a compartment that is stiff. Whatever inside the compartment, if the compartment, the wall are stiff, you perceive the palpation as stiff area. Right. So, in some cases, let's say like the typical tight band in trapezius, it can be that all these compartments become stiff, and so you perceive this sensation. Obviously, muscle spindle will not work properly, so the twitching response will be because the muscle spindle is at a high level, so right. the threshold will be less. So the twitching response could be due to this one. Um, this could be an hypothesis. But what is curious is that also in the study of Jay Shah, he didn't take a look at the fascia above. It doesn't look like normal. And when I studied the neck, the fascia of the neck, I didn't take a look at the muscle. And obviously, yeah. <laughs> is the point of view? Yeah, no, that, that, definitely, I, I I can see that. And but but these two things are so interrelated, uh, and definitely there is a tremendous effect of the one to the other. No no, no question about that. Research does point in terms of that. I mean, muscle muscle stiffness that will be created from uh, decrease of gliding of the fascia eventually can cause my fascia trigger points too. It, it will cause abnormal stresses within the muscle and therefore it can cause micro injury within the muscle fiber itself too. Well, in regard of this, I, I, we have just published in NYU, in the RASC uh, Rehabilitation Department, um, a nice article about uh, inject, for example, an enzyme that metabolizes the hyaluronic acid we have said that we can improve, we can decrease the stiffness in this way. So it would be like a chemical approach over this specific point that we have called the fiber that can prove as well what we do manually because the point where they were injected was the same that we treat manually. The assessment would be the same. So it was like an indirect way to prove that the stiffness can be related to disaggregation. Very good. And uh, I would like to encourage you, if you have any questions, you can ask them uh, right now. Uh, let's see. Um, there is another question by one of our viewers here. Is there a similarity in the effect between stecofascial manipulation and Graston technique by using tools? Any comment on that? Yeah. So, Graston technique with the tools. Um, <coughs> in our vision, works more in the superficial fascia. So we didn't have time to talk about that, but the superficial fascia, Tears cutaneous, is a layer that you, you have between or inside the hypoderma or subcutis. So this fascia, that is, uh, is called also scatter fascia in the dominal region, for example, is, uh, is innervated as well. Uh, it can generate a different symptom, but uh, the symptom will be more related like to like allogenia, uh, swelling, lipedema, uh, symptom that uh, can be more related to like a tender point. So, uh, in our perspective, if the tool glide over the skin uh, without generating a, a compression to reach the deep fascia, the result will be due to this tissue, so due to the effect, to the alteration of the stiffness of the uh, superficial fascia. If the tool, uh, I'm thinking about it, in this case, a small tool, uh, they reach the deep fascia, okay, in this case, uh, the effect could be similar. But the key element is the combination of the point that you treat. And one more time, the, the key element is to release the point uh, and make sure, and you can feel with your hand, also maybe through the, uh, the tool, that the tissue now is gliding perfectly in all the directions. So the major difference is that the, the drugastin, you glide normally in a slightly important surface. Fashion angulation, we stay below the limit of the skin. 
So if the skin allows you to glide like a two centimeter or three centimeter, we glide two centimeter because there will be no uh, gliding at all between, for example, our knuckle and the skin of the patient because the real gliding will occur between the deep fascia and the superficial fascia. That's a to generate a friction only deep fascia without bruise because at the end there will be no bruising, no fatigue at all. Very good. So, uh, uh, because uh, we're getting close to uh, end the uh, presentation, let's focus a little bit on, on treatment. If you can just um, give a very basic um, description of the treatment and give some examples of conditions or type of patients that can benefit from this. Well, we are treating patient uh, athletes until uh, Inpatient. Okay, so we are able to address a disorder that have a you know different kind of uh, origin. In any case, uh, you can treat typical muscle scatter problem, non-specific, but you can treat the compensation of specific muscle scatter problem because you can treat without any specific restriction people that have surgery for uh, meniscus, people that have shoulder for uh, surgery for shoulder, people that have previous trauma or previous fracture because in all these cases uh, the alteration of the connective tissue will generate the, the symptom. It can, the symptom can be 30, 40, up to 90 percent of what the patient has. It was proven later to that also completely need uh, prosthesis, okay, 18 percent of people still have pain. If this patient that come in my office, they get uh, definitely, definitely better because because it was not the cartilage, it was not the, the bone, it was not the ligament, it was the tissue around that was generated pain. So it's difficult to say how many conditions, but for sure we start from the sciatic pain, lower pain, neck pain, headaches, so we work very uh, epicondylitis. We have published more than 20 articles about the uh, muscle skeletal condition, and we have more than 100 articles about preclinical study. So we have demonstrated that we work for ankle pain, for knee pain, for hip, uh, after uh, a replacement, we have uh, two articles for low back, uh, we have uh, art two articles for neck pain, uh, one article for TMJ shoulder, and now two articles for carpal tunnel syndrome. And this was the more exciting because uh, worldwide we were one of the first that uh, we proved that with manual therapy we can prove uh, carpal tunnel syndrome. Because most of the time the entrapment under the ligament is like 30 40 percent, and then we have. 60% of entrapment on the way of the medianus. So, in that case, it's true. If you release a 30%, 40% of entrapment, you should have a full quality of life. Mm -hmm. But if you re release the other 30, 60% more proxima, you should have full quality of life. Yeah, at the same time, there is 8, 15% of the people that have a carpal tunnel syndrome release. It didn't get better. That's correct. Why? Because the entrapment was, uh, the majority of more entrapment proxima. was proxima. So this is a very critical element, uh, and there is article that prove that a lot of time the limitation of the nerve transmission is not below the carpal ligament, but it's some way above. But obviously no, nobody with the EMG evaluate. But with dynamic ultrasound, there is a great uh, special, amount of special right now that are able to identify the entrapment that they are more proximal. And so they prove that uh, with FM, uh, with uh, this kind of treatment, you can get better, and the patient also in the follow-up at three months, six months are still better in relation to the control group. Thank you. Uh, uh, describe also, um, I think we have another question. Let me grab that question real quick. Uh, in manual therapy, how therapists ensure that techniques can differentiate, differentially affect only fascial or other structures? How you can differentiate in the technique that you are affecting the fascia versus the muscle or other structures? Okay, excellent question. Um, <clears throat> obviously, there are the locations. So, we treat uh, only specific points that are mapped, they are codified. So, we are never, we never treat out of this point. So, the point uh, for sure are over other structures, muscle. If we are over the retinacula, below the retinacula, we will have tendon. But uh, the critical point is that you treat uh, until you restore the gliding. So obviously the tendon is a fixed element that uh, is not able to change their physical characteristic. Okay. So this uh, 
excellent uh, perception that you feel when it, you start to treat uh, patient complaining of high intensive pain, there is uh, like a rag rough surface. And this uh, sensation of rough surface, uh, it will disappear in a mean value of 2 minutes and 30 seconds. So this change of the quality of the tissue is obviously related to the fascia, eventually to the muscle, but cannot be related to an alteration of the tissue, bone, or other structure, because uh, it, it is a characteristic that is due to tissue that are able to change the physical characteristic. So we cannot exclude, but at the same time, we can already define where to treat uh, and what is the sensation that you will feel. Um, give us, uh, of course, uh, uh, my friends, uh, those of you who are watching, um, the program, you can go and find more information about the program, the fascial manipulation program of Dr. Steckwa at handsonseminars.com. But uh, um, Antonio, give us uh, some um, uh, idea about uh, the courses, how the courses are structured. So the course uh, is divided like uh, in three levels, level one, level two, level three. Level one, level two are related to muscle skeletal disorder. Level three for internal disorder, disorder of the superficial fascia. So level one, that is a key element that will allow you to practice right away, is six days divided into weekend. Uh, in this case, you will go from a, a overview about the anatomy, the physiology, and you will learn the point that has to be treated, as well the the guideline that will uh, we will teach for define from the scene of the patient which point to treat. Because the key element is that there is no defined point. Each patient have for the, with the same symptom have a different combination of points. So lucky for us, the points are well defined, but the combination is due to the guideline that we will give you. So the collection of the history and the palpation over this point will allow you to define clearly which point has to be treated. And this will help you to, to fix the problem in one, two, three treatment. Because all our studies we have published, we have treated the patient three, maximum four times, with follow-up at nine months. So this is what uh, makes people more excited worldwide, because we are present in more than 47 countries right now. We run more than 200 courses every year. So people are excited because, for sure, we give results, but it's all the technique we give results. But we are able to give results in two, three treatments, it, the long lasting is what is amazing because we are one of the few methods that have proved with the randomized control trial that we are able to give a result in nine months or long. And, and one of the very rare things in the area of rehabilitation medicine and manual therapy is to have a technique that is so well researched with so many publications backing it up, backing up the effectiveness backing up the physiology, the pathophysiology uh, of the concept. And, and this is absolutely amazing. So we do have uh, here in New York and uh, in uh, uh, West Palm Beach in Florida. I would like to thank you very much, Dr. Stecco, for uh, joining us tonight in discussing this uh, very, very interesting concept. Uh, I hope uh, the people who attended, uh, uh, they got some useful information from this. Uh, and um, um, we'll do another one sometime soon. Absolutely, it was already a pleasure for me and uh, you know, looking forward to meet you maybe in person in the future events. All right, thank you so much. Thank you. All right, my friends, good night from Hands On Seminars in New York. We hope to see you in uh, one of our uh, uh, future courses.